Hi, everyone. Welcome to our very first episode of MD Talk. My name is LaQuinta Jernigan, and I'm the Executive Vice President for the Americas at MD Group. Today, we are going to talk about a very important topic, diversity in clinical trials, or the lack thereof. I'm super excited to introduce our very first guest today for our show, Karen Correa. Karen comes to us as the Vice President, Global Head of Clinical Operations at Takeda. She's an author. She sits on many boards, including clinical leader and federally qualified health centers. And she is quite remarkable in the fact that she likes to use her knowledge and her experiences to inspire and motivate young women and girls who are pursuing STEM careers through motivational speaking and through various workshops. Welcome, Karen, to the show. We are so excited to have you today. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. This is a great honor. As you know, these are great topics, and I'm really excited to be a part of this. So thank you so much for the warm welcome. My pleasure. So diversity in clinical trials, I mean, it is a topic that has really gained momentum over the past year or so. It's not a new challenge for our industry by any means, but the COVID-19 pandemic has really highlighted just how big of an issue it really is. And it's brought it to the forefront. And now everyone's talking about it, which is so great because this is a topic that is a huge passion of mine to improve. And Karen, I know for you, you have um, focused on this topic for a lot of your career. And I, I'm curious to know what kind of led you to being interested in, in tackling this space? Wow. So actually two things was the, the opportunity that opened that door for me. Um, I happened to be a study coordinator and I was at a site um, for asthma and allergy. And I recall one of my patients passing. It was a young boy who was approximately about 14 years old. And it bothered me. And I was talking to my PI and some other staff members of, I just think of asthma as one of those chronic diseases that we should be able to control. And he's explained to me on how minorities um, happen to have a higher rate of death to um, asthma. And that's when I truly got to really see and embrace and understand what a disparity was, seeing it firsthand. And it was at that moment that I was just, flabbergasted, like, what do you mean? You know, we have a higher rate being a person of color. So I happened to start to read and learn more. I was actually in my master's program at the same time. So right then I was like, I know exactly what I am going to do my master's project on um, my, for my master's thesis. And it was, you know, diversity in clinical trials. And when I started to delve into this topic and to learn more about it, I was like, OMG, this is extremely important. And it was at that moment that I realized that one of the pieces of that disparity had so many parts that was unfolding, such as, you know, there was this um, less of representation in clinical trials, which means that is that impacting the healthcare? Is that impacting the delivery of the drugs? Is that impacting that the drugs are effective when they get to the market? So all of those, you know, types of questions were important to me. And that was kind of where it started and it became um, personal to me. I mean, that is an amazing story and it's spot on because what I was going to do next is kind of share some statistics to really set the tone for this conversation. And it feeds right into what you you experienced um, working as a study coordinator, Karen, because a few a few items just to point out more than 46,000 people took part in clinical trials in the U.S. in 2019. But of those people, 18 percent were Latinx only 9% were African-American and 9% were Asian. In the US, 20% of people living with multiple myeloma are African-Americans, yet they only account for 6% of all patients in related clinical trials. And this next statistic I think was the most shocking for me, especially considering the space we're in right now. And it's about COVID-19 trials. Um, Despite COVID-19 posing a greater risk to communities of color, only six, not 6%, but just six studies out of 1,500 of them um, actually that are registered in clinicaltrials.gov were actually collecting data on ethnicity. So if we're gonna tackle the problem, I feel like we should start by at least collecting that data, especially when it comes to COVID-19, when we all know know, the problems that it brought to communities of color. So 
you know, what you were just, the experience that you had, you know, yourself firsthand is, you know, just a tiny piece of the greater problem that we're experiencing right now. Because if you've had that experience, countless others have as well. Um, and I know personally, I have a coworker right now who is going through treatment um, for, for a cancer. And, you know, his, his physician told him, like, straight up that I'm, we're not certain how you're going to react to this treatment because there haven't been a lot of people from your ethnic background that completed the clinical trials. And so that's never news you want to hear as a, as a patient going through a treatment that is an approved treatment on the market. Um, and I think, you know, when you talk, when we talk about diversity in clinical trials, Karen, it, it seems like it seems like a big problem and, and big problems often seem very daunting to tackle, but I know it's a problem that our industry is trying to tackle. However, there are going to be some challenges there. And what do you perceive to be the biggest challenges that face our industry when trying to make this problem better? I think the greatest issue that we might be having is that, first of all, I want to just point out, there's a lot of different organizations, companies, industry that is doing a lot for diversity in clinical trials. And what the one thing is, it's kind of like when everybody is doing something, it, it you really can't see the impact because it's just little pieces. It's like pebbles, you know? But if you wanted to really build a pathway, you want to probably put some stones down. And stones, you need a lot of pebbles together to make one stone. So really what I see, and I think that that's what we're starting to see now with the pharma principles and FDA and other organizations, is we have to come together. Do you think about it? COVID, we were able to get the COVID vaccine trials and get COVID on the market and do what we're doing, you know, through us working together. It was when we started to work together that we were actually to make an impact. If every little company did their own little thing and nobody worked together, it wouldn't have happened. We are stronger together, divided we fall. And that's how we're gonna have the impact diversity in clinical trials, we have to work together. So it has it does has nothing to do with this company or that company or that CRO. If we don't work together as one, have one voice, we're not gonna stand. And so I think that's the, probably the greatest challenge that I see in this industry. And again, like you said, this is not any new topic. I've been working on this topic for over 25 years. As long as I've been in this industry, I've been hearing about diversity in clinical trials. So it's not new. So, so why is it that it's taken so hard for us to get from here to here? It's because we're all doing little pieces and we're only dealing with those little pieces transactional. No one is actually staying to the topic. It's kind of like, we're gonna make it an initiative or we're gonna make it um, a work stream, or we're gonna make it a task force. We, we know we need it to be in the DNA. We need it to be in everything that we do from the beginning to the end. It needs to be sustainable. And that is what I think is the challenges that we're having in the industry. And what I see now is everyone's like, whoa, for it to really make any impact, we gotta like make this happen, make it happen together and keep it so we can it can repeat itself. You know, So I think that's the piece. And I think that people are seeing that and I think that's where we're gonna be moving forward for it to make any difference. I think you're right. Um, and it's it's really important when it comes to anything, anything that you're trying to action change for, for you to have that kind of step back view where it's like, okay, you know, change is happening. It's happening small, small pebbles, but you're right. We do need to come make those bigger rocks. And I personally feel like this time, I mean, you're right, Karen, this has been a, an issue for so long, but I feel like it feels different this time. It feels like yeah. we're gonna get somewhere. And I'm holding yeah. on to that that optimism because I think no. that we've got, we've, we've got some good people. We've got some smart people who are now talking about it on a bigger level. And there are so many very interesting grassroots organizations that pop, that are popping up left and right that are making impact in this space too. But you're right. We're going to have to come together to really, to really tackle it. Um, another question I have for you, Karen, you know, if we're, we're looking at all these different ways we can come together and, and address the issue, one of my questions is, you know, is there an issue with awareness of clinical trials within these yes. communities? Do we need yes. to start there? Yes, absolutely. Awareness, listen, awareness and access. Those are, those are cute. There's this, like this amazing thing. So, cause again, it's kind of like, I say this all the time and I keep on, I'm gonna stay, I'm gonna stick with my quotes because they, they're so powerful. It's about knowledge. You know, knowledge is one piece. Like, you know, that people say knowledge is power. Well, there's a little bit more to that. 
Knowledge is power, but you got to have knowledge. So you got to make sure people ha know about something. If people don't know what a clinical trial is, how to get into a clinical trial, what the benefits are or the risk, then they can't make a decision. They can't make an informed decision. And then if they do know about it, but they don't have access, that's another issue. So you, you, you've got to like hit all of those different pieces of it. So someone like your friend might have cancer. Does that person know that there are clinical trials within that you know indication that they're in? And if they do, is it accessible to them? Because unfortunately, they could be going to Dr. Jones. Dr. Jones might not be conducting a clinical trial. And Dr. Jones is not aware that Dr. Smith at another institution is doing a clinical trial within multiple myeloma, you know, non-small cell lung cancer or whatever, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. They might not be aware. They might not be talking. So this doctor does not know to, you know, recommend this patient to that doctor, or they don't have a process in place to recommend, or they don't want to recommend. Let's not talk about those situations. So there's so many pieces to that process. So again, so this patient is only have access to what's here in the door with that physician. So until you get rid of it, so they don't know about it and then they don't have access to it. And then if they yeah. do have access, then is it available to them? So that's the other thing. So do they qualify? You know, do they have the insurance to cover any other pieces of the trial that maybe is not covered by the trial? There's, like I said, this, this problem is really, um, it has so many prongs to it, unfortunately. Um, but again, a little bit at a time. Let's start talking about knowledge. Let's start talking about awareness. Let's talk about access. Absolutely. I mean, we could have a whole nother session on insurance. Um, yeah, alone. That's a whole nother problem. Right? <laughs> but I mean, you bring up a good point. Um, the awareness and education, it's not just for the patients, it's for the, the sites. Um, because a lot of times when we're looking at these communities and we're saying, okay, well, you know, why aren't the diverse communities participating? The the physicians that serve in the, the hospitals and the community centers that service these communities, they're not, they don't participate in clinical trials. And maybe it's because they were never asked. I mean, so like bringing that awareness and that education to the sites, to the patients, I mean, that has got to be a critical element of, of tackling this problem. No, absolutely. And they don't have the time. You know, we all go to the doctors. There's nothing new. I go to doctors, you go to doctors. We all have like whatever chronic diseases we're dealing with. You might have high, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. You might just be going for your normal exams. You know, if you are female, you're going for mammograms. If you are of a certain age, you're going for colonoscopies, whatever those cases may be, right? Your doctor has to get you in and out. He, he or she has this much time to send with you. Okay, I need you to do this. What's your background? I need you to get these labs. I need you to get these meds. What meds are you on? By the time he's done with that, we're in that little 15, 20 minutes. He's going to say, oh, by the way, I noticed that you have high cholesterol. You know, there's a cholesterol trial at Dr. So-and-so's office. And let me explain that to you. Where is that in his process? They don't have that time. So <laughs> they're like I said, it's, it's bigger than that. It's, as they say, it's bigger than us. <laughs> it, it it's, it's a real issue, you know. Yeah. And, and I think like you and I separately have talked about this. I mean, this is an issue, you know, just looking at the process and how, how you refer a patient, how you enroll a patient. I mean, there's so many issues that we can tackle at the, you know, kind of consultative, consultative level where I sit, the pharma level where you sit, but then we've got to go further. We've got to go to the government level, legislation. I mean, there's a lot here. And when you look at it like that, it's huge. It's a lot to tackle. But again, small pebbles make a big stone. Um, right. So when we're talking about kind of reaching into these communities and into these sites, I mean, who are some of the key players that you you feel are going to be instrumental and in, per and in raising awareness and 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 kind of infiltrating these communities and engaging with them about clinical research? So it's the same things that we did for anything else. So if we want a community to be aware, we have to see I, it's something I said a long time ago. I had this published in an article where people pay, pray, and play. Those are my three P's. You have to reach people where they're at, which is like we're doing right now with the COVID vaccine. Where do they play? I heard that just recently that at the Flyers games, they were given vaccinations in Philly. Okay, that was an interesting, where people pray. How many churches have done education? I've been involved in them on the COVID vaccine. 
you know, getting your COVID vaccine. So where people pray, and it doesn't mean, you know, the church, which could, when it prays, just whatever temple, whatever organizations that they go to to get support, they, they, whatever their support system is. So I want to make sure I inclusive of all types of groups. Doesn't mean you pray, that's just my group, but there's, it could be any type of support system that you go to and then where people pay. So that's organizations. I know at my company, we've done educations about the vaccine. A lot of different people who work at different companies. I went and did an educational thing at a nonprofit organization um, in um, Philadelphia. It's a huge nonprofit organization. They wanted to educate all of their staff on, you know, the COVID vaccine. So that's about like where people get, you know, information. So you have to think about where do people get information that is where we start so you have to make sure all of those different groups are aware so you have a primary care physician you have all of the healthcare streams so you've got a nurse that needs to understand that you have your lab techs that need to understand so everybody in that healthcare industry but then that's just their healthcare. then everything their educational system we have colleges universities you start educating edu educating that different group and you know my, my youngest is the last one about to finish college out of five you know, should everyone in a college education system understand what that part is? They know about going to the doctor. Why shouldn't they understand that part about what a clinical yeah. trial is? You know, when we're doing basic education, you know, and then just different community services. Wherever people are getting educated on anything else, they should be learning about clinical trials and their option of standpoint of their care. All of those things are different and very important for them. And you have to make sure that it's consistent and it's over and over and over. People feel like I constantly can't turn the TV on and learn something about COVID. There's always something going on. No, there's the new, you know, the new stress. But it needs to be like that for healthcare. For us as a company, as an industry, to change the healthcare dynamics. And people say, well, what does clinical trials really have to do with healthcare? It has a lot to do with it. We want to improve the treatments. Well, we got to get people in the trials. We have that, you know, patients help us get more data so that we can learn more about the diseases and the indications that we're working on. So improving that improves helps is a part of helping with that delivery, you know. So it's just a big piece and it's a lot of different um, faucets that we have to go down. And it's not it's not a one size fit all. The way you find out information might be completely different than the way I find out information. So we have yeah. to reach every community where they're at. And when you talk about different ethnicities and races, different groups will learn about different information differently. So you're speaking of, you know, and we say, uh, you know, as a Hispanic population, are we talking about how Cubans find out versus how Puerto Ricans find out, how Mexicans find out? Like, what are the community, what are the community social environments that they are in so that they learn about things? What are, the, what are they talking about? When, where, where, and how? And you talk about the black community. Okay, well, are we talking about um, African Americans who are, you know, who've been here and have been, you know, naturalized here? Or are we talking about people who have migrated here from the Cubans, from, you know, from different um, Caribbean areas, excuse me, or from Africa? So like those, those communities have different networks that we might not be in. So, you know, same thing with any type of Asian communities. Like you, you can't just say it's a one size fit all. We're gonna just reach everybody this way. That's, that's not how it's gonna work. So, no, yeah. it's, it's, you're absolutely right. And, you know, I think back to, like you said, like with, with COVID, you can't, you can't escape it. It's everywhere. You're on Instagram and it's like, learn more about COVID-19. Why can't it be like that with clinical trials? I mean, growing up for me, it was smoking. Cigarette smoking is bad. Yeah. I mean, there was so much, so many PSAs about cigarette smoking that like you left school knowing cigarette smoking is bad. <laughs> and like you, it was on everything. I mean, it, that, I've never thought about it until you just said it, Karen. But yeah, I mean, clinical research needs to have that awareness because it is so important in bringing down the disparities in healthcare, making healthcare more accessible, and and, and treating so many different diseases. But it, it really could be that you know we need to we need to bring that education in at an early age, and it needs to be consistent throughout and everywhere you look. And you know, the other point you just made is spot on too. I think so many times, and, and you know, I can even be subject of the same thing when we're putting together how we're going to communicate anything out to the public marketing plans or whatever we often think about ourselves we think like how we want to hear it how we're used to hearing and receiving information and it is not a one size fits all um, i know so many older black women who only found out that the covid vaccine was available because their preacher said so at church on sunday and that's how they knew where to go and they got in line and they went because someone they trusted and went to for information that yeah. they could count on told them and and to your point that's one example about a church but every culture and community has that figure they have yeah. that 
center of place where they go for trusted information that is relevant to them and their beliefs and their way of life. And if we can't reach those individuals and those groups, we don't have a chance um, in kind of tackling the issue. And yeah, and if you're just thinking about the U.S. only, there's 330 million people that deserve to hear the truth. They deserve trusted information that is reachable for them, that is attainable for them. You know, I look and, and it could be different in within a, in within a household. You know, my husband's Puerto Rican and I'm African American. When I look at him and I think about how his community, like the well, it was still my family, but like my you know, in my family with through him, how they make reach you know communication information is completely different. You know than maybe the you know family that I'm actually biologically related to. So you have to be a, open to that. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's the only way that we're gonna move forward. And then you also have to think about the different generational gaps. So having, you know, five adult children, I have who, you know, well about to be 21, 21 to 28. They're pretty much close in how they hear and learn about stuff. But when I think about that gap of children, and then I think about my age group, and then I think about nieces and nephews who are in the thirties, and then, you know, like, and so forth. Everybody is on different, even different social medias, you know? You know, That's I true. remember when my kids left Facebook so that they wouldn't have to be followed by me and went to Instagram. I was like, hmm. <laughs> Oh, I gotta go to Instagram now, you know. <laughs> They're like old people on Facebook. That's how my kids tell me. It's like mom, old people are on Facebook. I'm like, okay, all right. So I gotta but, go to Instagram to find you. You're right, though, but that's a, that is a really relevant example of how you can't just stick with the the status quo and go with what you know for for all of your communication efforts. Um, it's got to yeah. be tailored. And I think that, you know, all the things that we've talked about, I think it's so easy, you know, especially when we talk about the black community in the U.S., um, it's so easy to just kind of blame all the lack of diversity on Tuskegee and, and things that have happened in the past. But I think that what we've pointed out today is that it's so much more complex than that. It's not just that one incident that was awful. And yes, people remember and is worth talking about. But if you bring it to present day, all these other factors we've just brought into play, they're also inhibiting us from cre creating diversity in clinical trials. So we need to have this, this broader approach um, right. for tackling it. And I mean, when you, and you talk about trust, when you say that it's really not the issues or the government trials that was conducted at Tuskegee that is the issue. It's really more of just trust. If I don't yeah. trust the industry, if there, if I feel that there are, you know, racial issues in the healthcare industry, that ain't got that has nothing to do with what happened in the past. That happens the way I may be treated today in the healthcare industry. Mrs. Jones, my, I, you know, it's, it's very interesting. I have a, um, a really good friend of mine that I grew up with and her mother is kind of like my second mom. I remember meeting, you know, speaking with her and I didn't get to approve to say her name, so I won't. But Mrs. So-and-so, <laughs> she, um, we were talking about one day, she was talking about her high blood pressure medicine. And she told me, she's like, uh, I tell my doctor, I'm not taking it on the weekends. I said, what do you mean? She's like, my body needs a break. I was like, okay. So she just gave her own way she's going to treat herself. She is healthy as they can be. She is almost in her 80s. She probably can outwalk you and I. She looks <laughs> absolutely amazing. Girl, this whole time she's been on her blood pressure medicine, she has never taken it on the weekend. She says, my body needs a break. She takes it Monday through Friday. Saturday, Sunday, she don't take her blood pressure medicine. Never heard of it. That's her way. But but, her, but she was just saying, I don't trust what the doctor's going to say. And the doctor doesn't know my body. Okay. That had nothing to do with what was in the past. She was just like, you know, my doctor didn't listen to me. So I'll, you know, I'll listen to my body and I'll do it my way. And she's fine. I mean, she's healthy. Like, I'm amazed. I am unfortunately have lost my mother and my father. Both my parents are gone. So, but my really, really good friend's mother is still living, still walking every day, still driving, still doing everything. And she is kicking it. I'm like, listen, I'm going to do like she's doing. But the point is that trust had nothing to do with some trial that happened before. That trust has to do with, she feels like her doctor doesn't listen to her. Maybe she's not on the right dose, whatever the case may be. So she, she took it upon herself to find out what works for her. So there's like, you got to have those trusting relationships with your healthcare providers. And again, that happens with, like I said, being on the board of Federal Qualified Health Center, providers don't have that much time to be able to re meet with you. They have a limited amount of time, unless you have concierge healthcare, which people know about, like where you, you know, pay within this concierge service. If you don't have that kind of, usually your doctor, you know, so nurse practitioner or PA, whoever you meet with, they have but a limited amount of time to meet with you. And if you're someone with a whole lot of meds and a whole lot of issues, 
and you only meet with them once a year, twice a year, whatever chronic disease you're, you're managing, it can be very hard for them to keep up with that. It's not that they don't care. They just don't have the time, you know? Yeah. I mean, and that is something that has to be addressed because not have, I mean, it's so, it's a cycle. Not having the time leads to you feeling like your, your doctor's not listening, Le- makes you feel like you can't trust them. I mean, and so it's just like such a vicious cycle, but those are the, that's exactly the, those are the types of incidents, Karen, you're right. These are the incidents that people are ref- like referring to when they say they have a lack of trust, not the trials that took place in the, in the past, um, especially for this generation, like our generation, you and, you and my generations, but also like the younger ones. Um, so it's, it's, it's got to be tackled on that level somehow. We've got to, to build that trust and we've got to be able to talk to the people who they do trust, like their community leaders and their religious leaders. Um, How do you feel, okay, especially talking about like your kids' generation and the ones coming up, how do you think technology is going to play into this? And can we tap tap into technology to increase awareness, you know, make trials more accessible? I I feel like with this new generation that's coming up, we might be pushed to think outside the box a little bit. What are your thoughts on that? Oh my gosh, such a great question. And so I'm going to go with this, um, one of the most famous people in, in my time that I just look up to so much. And her name is Dr. Frida Lewis Hall. So Dr. Frida Lewis Hall was the chief medical officer at Pfizer when I worked there and she was overseeing the diversity and clinical trials and I led it under her. She said a quote one time at a meeting and I don't know if it was originally from her, but when she said it, it resonated to me. She says, we're trying to solve. <laughs> she says, we're trying to solve Star Wars problems with Flint, with Flintstones tools. <laughs> and I was I like... It. Okay, it was it was so profound because how many of us grew up on the Jetsons? Okay, I'm dating myself here. So I grew up on the Jetsons Me and too. I watched that cartoon and I was like, oh my gosh. And you remember he would pull up and talk to his do- his boss up on the computer and like, it was just amazing. The car was <laughs> flying and we were like, and the food would come out. <laughs> oh my gosh, we're living yeah. that right now. We're living <laughs> that right now. We are living the Jetsons for those who of us who grew up on the Jetsons. So yes, we are trying so hard to reach this population who are in a different world. They're not, my, you know, my grandkids can get through my, my cell phone better than I can. My grandkids be like this. I'm like, how do you know what, like they know how to pull up on the, they grew up and here. I grew up on a typewriter where your fingers would get stuck in yes. between the keys and stuff. And if you did, it hurt. And you know, that's how you learn to type and they covered up the keys so you wouldn't learn, you know, the code, the, 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 the number, the letters that you were supposed to know. That's how I grew up. They grew up with a, a smartphone in their hand. So it is a different generation. And we think that we want to do the same way with them with clinical trials. That's why decentralized trials are amazing and moving forward. And now people are saying, okay, well, wait a minute. Why can't we just have telehealth? Well, COVID might have pushed us in that area where someone was struggling, but they're realizing we can get the same thing. I can sit here and have the conversation. Half the time, your doctor don't even touch you. So what is the point of you going into an office to see them? What they do, check your blood pressure? I, usually, they're going to be so poor, well, you know, like, okay, do it on your phone, get your blood pressure, do your EKG, blah, blah, send me it to while we're talking. Why do I need to be there? You don't really need to be there. So we have to think about the current technology and how the kids are doing. Now, I do realize that there are some people who still that's not going to work in every situation, but I would say a great percentage of the time, a lot of our younger generation and even you know other generations are looking for a more um, technology advanced way of doing clinical trials. And I think that's how we're going to reach people. And I think that's how we can do that with awareness. So again, things spread, you know, like wildfire now through, you know, my kids, learn about stuff way more than I do. They're like, did you hear about so-and-so? Or did you know about so-and-so? I'm like, how did you know? Oh, mom, it was on so-and-so. I'm like, okay. Like, they just know stuff and they know data and they know, it's just a completely different, completely different. It's a completely different world. I mean, my daughter was like, yeah, mom, I just signed up for my uh, Pfizer vaccine. She's 12. She just turned 12 (laughs) May 1st. And, you know, she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm signed up. We're going Wednesday. And I mean, like she navigated that whole process. 
going to Walgreens, signing up online on her own, on her smartphone. And yes. my, my six-year-old son, he will literally make a case for getting a new Lego set with a PowerPoint presentation that's interactive with videos. Because this is how they learn right now, especially in, with COVID. He started kindergarten virtually. You know, he brings his little laptop to school every day. So it is an entirely different generation now. And I think that the telehealth piece has been remarkable in so many ways because it is bringing healthcare to more people. I mean, you know, so many people will sit around with something that's bothering them because of the hassle it might be to get to the doctor's office. And now, you know, COVID made it very popular for them to be able to have that access via telehealth. So I think that that's going to be that part of clinical trials is, is going to be here to stay. The decentralized solutions um, that can support clinical trials are only going to make vast improvements from here on out. And we learned from Amazon, direct to patient. Yes. That's yes. Like, I mean, that's a prime example. Look how many small businesses, unfortunately, and I'm by no means ex ex excited about that because I, you know, I believe in our small businesses and our mom and pop organizations that had like these amazing whatever they developed or made. And, you know, you go there and you pick it up and everything. But a yeah. lot of those businesses who were not tech savvy and were not able to just immediately transition into more of, you know, pickup, delivery, blah, 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 you know, whatever the case may be, they, they weren't able to be sustainable. Um, and Amazon just came in. Like you said, you know, as someone was saying that, oh, I might have a package coming today. I think we probably get packages on a daily basis because we're just, it's like direct to patient, you know? And so just when we think about that and, and move that into healthcare, that's where the difference is going to, is going to come. We, we, we just have to think differently. We have to, to be sustainable. I agree. Well, I guess, Karen, on that note, what are what would be your final takeaway for anyone watching this today who might have stumbled upon it and not been aware of the challenges or maybe it's resonated with them for a while and now their, you know, their passion has been reignited? What could be a final takeaway for anyone watching that you want them to leave with um, as a conclusion of this interview? I think that we are stronger together. I think as we as an industry, I think when pharma companies, biotech companies, CROs, other type of chain suppliers, when we all come together and look for, you know, common ground uh, solutions, that's where we're going to all make a difference. I know that we are, you know, and I don't want to say that we're competitive or competing or whatever. We all have our own drugs or devices or whatever we're working on. Yes, that keep that. That's important. That's what keeps you as a business. But when it comes to making sure access and awareness is for all of for everyone we have to come together that we cannot do in a silo it will not work and once we do that we will see things the uptake and the delivery and then we will be able to change the difference and then another portion about that trust trust is something you know um it's kind of like trust and respect they kind of go hand in hand and something that my father taught me who was served in the military for 26 years which whose flag is behind me and no longer with me and i look at it every day he told me something he says you know courtesy is given and respect is earned so we can be courteous to our patients but to truly gain their respect is by our actions and i think that when we have true actions that are focused on the patients and not on ourselves, that's when it's going to change. And that's when we're going to gain trust. So that's how I'd like to leave people. Well, that's a great, great note to leave people with. Um, and, and it's so true. Um, thank you so much, Karen. If How can thank people you. connect with you if they see this and they're just like, I got to know more. I need to speak to this lady. What's the best way to connect to you? I'm Karen Correa on LinkedIn. That's like my big, like, you know, I try to like keep it because you know, on other social medias, but that's the one I try to make a focus on that I try to respond to on a daily basis um, because it is the professional platform. I think LinkedIn has done a lot, you know, for us as an industry, connecting people to one another. Please reach out to me. I mean, I, I've been in this topic. My master's and my PhD dissertation was on diversity and clinical trials. I live and breathe. I care about this more than anything. Um, and not because it's about diversity. It's about, I feel that if we can reach the, the the underserved population along the way we're going to reach everybody so it's kind of like if you go if you go to where the, the least of us then everyone gains awesome i mean thank you so much karen any day that i get to have this type of conversation with you is a great day i love talking to you about thank topics you. like this 
Your passion is contagious. Um, and for everyone out there watching, thank you so much for joining us on today's session. Um, you can find us on social media. You can follow us on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and our YouTube channel. And we look forward to seeing you at our next episode of MD Talk. Thanks so much. Thank you. Have a good one.